Charles will give you a bit more background on what NDCs that we've been talking about in the introduction that we have in our name of the NDC Finance Initiative to this webinar on business and climate, partnering and investing in resilient economies. My name is Lena Wokek and I run a small outfit called Futureways and have been working with the German um, international cooperation agency GIZ for about two years to support the NDC Finance Initiative for the Caribbean, which you will be hearing a lot more about um, as we go through this webinar. What will we be talking about today? This webinar, in fact, has been in the making actually for a while before we knew that we would not be able to meet all of you face to face. Climate change, of course, alone is a challenge substantial enough to necess necessitate a proactive collaboration across governments, international partners, and very importantly, the private sector in the Caribbean. So we've been talking about this at the NDC Finance Initiative for a while. Um, with the current crisis and the challenge to weather the storms of the COVID-19 crisis and the socioeconomic impacts that is having, this partnership and this engagement and collaboration across sectors, of course, only becomes more important. So what are we going to be talking about today? We'll be talking about the context and rationale for implementing increasingly ambitious climate commitments in the region. We'll be talking about the investment opportunities in that context and specifically in the context of nationally determined contributions. Again, you'll be hearing a lot more about what exactly those are and what that means for Caribbean countries um, and any complementary climate action, of course, and uh, across, across the region. We'll be talking about the business case for investing in the development of low carbon climate resilient economies in the region. And we'll be doing so in general, but also, of course, in particular, in the context of a green reco recovery from the impacts of the pandemic. We'll be trying to put the climate action that has been a priority for many across the region for a while into the context of building back vector by aligning COVID-19 crisis action and recovery plans with urgent investments in low carbon climate resilient economies in the Caribbean. With me today, I have an impressive panel of speakers that will be speaking to you. Our lead panelist is Raquel Moses, the CEO of the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator. She has almost two decades of business management experience in the region and has um, extensive experience driving investment projects. We have um, Chamberlain Emmanuel, who will be opening the session in a, in a moment. He's the head of the Environment and Sustainability Cluster at the Organi Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and a civil engineer with a wealth of experience in managing projects and in leading people. We then have Leon Charles um, of Charles and Associates who is one of the region's most experienced climate change professionals and a, and a real veteran um, of the UNFCCC process as well, where he's been a key figure in promoting the interest of island countries for, for many years. We have Crispin Dauvergne, who is the program director of the Climate and Disaster Resilience um, Project Program at the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States Commission. He's another leading figure on all things climate change in the region. And before joining the OECS has worked with the government of St. Lucia for a long time. Um, and we have Annette Leo, who also has an impressive career in advancing sustainable development and environmental management in the region. And who is the chief sustainable development and environment officer of the government of St. Lucia. Um, and then at the end of the webinar, we'll be taking a bit of an outlook as to what we're doing next and are joined by Alexander Huppertz, who's project manager at Get Invest, and who will be giving us a bit of a sneak peek into what's next and what, we're what else we're planning to do in this space in the next little while. So just to give you an, an, an overview, this is how we're hoping to manage our time today. Um, We'll have opening remarks. Leon, Charles will give you a bit more background on 
what NDCs that we've been talking about in the introduction that we have in our name of the NDC Finance Initiative, what they actually are and how we got them. Chris Pintovarin will be talking a bit more about practically how does that look in the OECS? What do NDCs look like for OECS countries? And then we have Annette Rattigan Leo talking about the NDC Finance Initiative, the initiative kind of behind bringing together this webinar today. Um, and then we have our um, key presentation from Raquel Moses coming to us from the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator. We'll be talking about opportunities for investment in the region, in climate. Um, and she'll be giving us a bit of a bigger picture on, on, on what the contexts are, what the, what the numbers are and all of that, but also some very concrete examples on, on how that will look. We'll then have some time to look at Q&As. So please do have your questions coming. S quick reminder to make sure you actually put the quest your questions and any comments you may have in the Q&A section rather than in the chat, because they do tend to get lost a little bit there sometimes. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some, some fruitful discussion on the basis of, I think, some very valuable inputs. So thank you very much to all of our speakers. And with that, may I hand over to you, Chamberlain, to open the session for us, please. Thank you very much, Lena, and good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. I will be very brief, so we go straight into the meat of the matter. Uh, the OECS, um, on a whole, OECS Commission is endeavoring to build resilience to climate change and to transition to low carbon economies in line with the goals and ambitions of the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. We have several initiatives um, which we use to support our member states and the region generally. Uh, and among these, the NDC Finance Initiative, the NDCFI, is our flagship initiative uh, to create an ecosystem for enabling member states' capacity and engaging private sector as a critical enabler. Also supporting this, we have recently articulated a green blue economy strategy and action plan. And we are nearly at the end of a critical process of revising the St. George's Declaration, which, is, which has been a, our 20 year articulation of, of action and priorities for environment in the sub-region. Today, I am very pleased to welcome you um, from your various countries and, and sectors to participate in this webinar. We thank you for taking time to participate and we look forward to your engagement. I also want to thank in a special way our partners, in particular Get Invest and by extension GIZ and want to specially welcome also to this partnership, the Climate Accelerator. We thank you all for your for, your, um, for lending us your, your support and your expertise today. And I really look forward to an engaging conversation so that we can continue to learn and advance in this roadmap. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chamberlain, for, for um, these opening remarks. Before we dive into the presentation, we would quite like to hear a little bit more from you um, as well and have some questions for you um, around the extent to which climate change already features in your business and organizational strategy. Is that something that is central to your business model? Is it integrated in strategic objectives and operational decision making? Or is it more that you have some internal champions and, and action going on? Um, or that it's on the agenda, but not much action yet, or it's really not at all on the agenda yet. And we would like to get a bit of a sense of how familiar you are with what NDCs are. Are they, central, are they a central part of the job that you're doing? Do you have some knowledge about what NDCs are? Do you have a vague idea really, but no specific knowledge? Or are you indeed here with that question, what are NDCs? Which we will obviously be answering today. 
I'll just let a few more responses come in. I see a lot of you are busy, so please do share your inputs with us. And maybe Leon, in the meantime, you can already pull up your slides if you would like, because that's, that's what's coming next. I still see the numbers ticking, so I'll give you 10 more seconds to put in your response if you haven't yet. All right, here you go. So Leon, that's good news for you. We're actually talking to a number of people for whom uh, climate is already central to the business model, is something that is fairly firmly integrated um, we also have a lot of people for whom NDCs are central to their jobs. A lot of people have at least some knowledge. But we do also have some people who are really new to the NDC topic. We also have a few people where in their organizations, climate is not on the agenda yet. So the challenge is yours to straddle that spectrum and make sure you bring on board all those of us who are, who are new to this whilst I'm keeping all those of us who are not excited. The floor is yours, Leon. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much and welcome to all the participants. Uh, I'm not sure if it's morning, afternoon or night. So it's interesting, a good day. And um, we'll take it from there. Um, I'll be talking about NDCs, where they came from, what they contained, and how important they are in this process. And uh, I'll basically cover five aspects of an NDC. First of all, I'll speak a little bit about what is an NDC. Then I'll talk about where it came from. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about the content of NDCs and how they're embedded in the Paris Agreement and then the role in the context of national development. But they're in fact are turning out to be a very useful national development tool. Now, Conceptually, NDCs are extremely important in the climate process. And I choose this as an illustration of how important they are. I will say that they are the engine of the Paris Agreement. Why the engine? Because the Paris Agreement is intended to address the question of global emissions and the impacts of climate change. And the actions by countries are captured in the NDCs. If there are no NDCs, there will be no actions to address um, climate change. So what drives the Paris Agreement and all the other things that surround the Paris Agreement is what you put into these NDCs. So what are these NDCs? Very simply, it's a country's contribution to addressing climate change. What are you going to do as a country? Are you going to reduce emissions and by how much? Or are you going to, in fact, be trying to work with the impacts of climate change and what aspects and what sectors are you going to be working with. Um, so it could be a mitigation contribution, it could be an adaptation contribution, or it could be both. The critical thing about NDCs, and I'll come back to that over and over again, is that the NDC, the nature of the contribution and the level of the contribution is determined by the country. However, there's a caveat. You cannot just pick a figure. You have to justify it to show that it represents your best effort in addressing climate change. Now, that may sound a little contradictory to some of you, but it's the result of very difficult negotiations. And therefore, I want to move on to talking about where this thing came from, where these NDCs came from, um, and why we have these sort of internal um, conditionalities. Now, this here is a picture of what we call a huddle in the UNFCCC process. It is when you're negotiating an issue and the formal back and forth from your seats simply can't work because the issue is too complex. 
people then will take a break from the formal negotiations, get together in an informal group, and try to trash it out there. And then what comes out from this hurdle comes back on the floor and you're formally adopted. And the concept of NDC actually came from one of these hurdles because it was difficult to trash out the issues surrounding what country should contribute or what country should commit to. Um, that hurdle took place in 2013 in a meeting in Warsaw. And for those of you who are interested in finding the actual document, it is decision one CP13 Paris 2B and 2C. Um, the context of this hurdle, and it'll, I digress over two or three minutes to give you a couple of anecdotes. Um, the Paris Agreement is not the first attempt to forge a global compact on climate change. In fact, it's a third attempt, third formal attempt. I could give you more if we get into the informalities. Um, the first one was the UNFCCC Convention in 1992, where countries agreed to voluntary efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to 1990 levels by 2000. Nobody took that seriously, so there were no reductions. The emissions just kept going up and up. And following that, in 1997, the Kyoto Protocol was agreed to, where some countries, the developed countries, took legal commitments to reduce emissions on an average by 5.2% over the 28 to 2012 period, which are called the first commitment period. There were separate responsibilities for developed and developing countries. And the largest emitters, including the United States, did not participate in the Kyoto Protocol. In addition, the emissions from some of the larger developing countries are rising, like India and China and so on, and they were not included in the Kyoto Protocol. So if you look at this data here, you will see that the three countries I've highlighted in red, China, the United States, and India, account for close to 45% of global emissions. And these were not part of the Kyoto Protocol. So the question that came up as we were looking at strengthening climate action is how do you have a global agreement to reduce emissions when over half of the emissions were not represented in the agreement? And therefore the question was then, how do we get everybody to be part of the process? And those of you who are a part of the inter international environmental processes would appreciate that there is something called one of the principles in the process is called the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. And that, that differentiation between what the developed countries are doing and the developing countries was part of the implementation of that principle, where, where we have common responsibilities um, we had the differentiated actions which we had to take. But that was creating a problem because we needed to bring everybody on board. And therefore, the debate when we were in developing the Paris Agreement was how do we do that? The first thing some countries didn't like was the whole question of commitment. The larger developing countries did not want to be having legal commitments. They did not mind putting in an effort, but they didn't want any commitments. So the word contribution was raised as an alternative to commitment. So that everybody will make an effort, but they don't, they're not legally bound. So if they don't achieve it, then you don't necessarily have penalties against them. The other significant breakthrough here, and I'm really short circuit in a much longer debate, is that it was agreed that if everybody was going to make a contribution, nobody was going to tell them what that contribution should be that contribution should be in light of the national circumstances. So you make your best effort. If you're a large country and you can reduce by one gigaton, you go ahead and do it. If you're a small island developing states and you can only reduce by 10 grams, then that, that, that's your contribution. So that's why it's important that you be able to show that you give me your, your best effort. So parties submitted the intended national, national determined contribution in the run-up to Paris, and once they ratified the Paris Agreement, it was converted to NDCs, which basically is your commitment to what you're going to do, your best effort to address climate change. Now, in Paris Agreement, therefore, there is a framework which governs how NDCs should function. First of all, parties are legally bound, and that's a point which I want to emphasize here. 
you're legally bound to prepare, communicate, and maintain successive nationally developed contributions. So if you do not submit one, then you're subject to some kind of sanction. However, the content of what you submit is totally up to you. Okay. So that some people have, have criticized that for being a very weak provision because you can submit something that is really very, not very ambitious, which is true. But part of the principle of the Paris Agreement, as I show in a minute, is that you successively strengthen your ambition. Um, so NDC should reflect the party's highest ambition. And we have to communicate NDCs every five years. We can communicate an NDC for a five-year period or a 10-year period. But if you're doing it for a 10-year period, you have to do an update every five years. So basically, every five years is a cycle of submissions. The first submissions were in 2015. So this year is an important year where there's a second cycle of successive NDCs. Now, critical to the submission of the second and third NDCs is this principle of no backsliding, that successive NDCs have to represent a progression beyond the first NDC. So if your first NDC had a reduction by 5%, your successive one cannot be less than 5%. It has to be 7% or 10% or 20% and so on. And parties have to account for it in that they have to show how it contributed to emissions reduction. Part of the challenge we had a small island development state was that we didn't have all the expertise needed to develop NDCs. And therefore, the Paris Agreement brought in a facility called the Capacity Building Initiative and Transparency to provide support to developing countries in designing and implementing NDCs. The Paris Agreement also provides the information that has to be provided when you're providing your NDC. I wouldn't go through it in detail, um, but essentially what it says is that it should be quantifiable. That it, you should say how much, what it is you're going to be achieving, when, how you developed it, and so on. So NDCs are therefore become a major document for national countries in terms of how they address climate change. And therefore, for, at a national level, it is a very important policy tool. It's an opportunity to develop low emission strategies for countries. It has the potential for being a platform for re receiving international support um, through the Green Climate Fund and other sources of, of finance. And it requires supporting systems which will strengthen national programming in a variety of ways. Because you have to account for it, monitor it, and report on it, then your overall transparency of your national development processes and your stakeholder processes are improved. So I'm ending here with this. Um, graphic which shows you the life cycle of an NDC and what it quickly does if you start with the NDCs in the yellow you see we prepare it we submit it and then we move on to the right hand side you have to account for it and report on it then it has to be assessed to see how much you've done and then based on what you've achieved so far you're then going to your next cycle which hopefully is going to be progressively more ambitious than the previous cycle so essentially in a nutshell that's where it came from. It's a country's contribution in an effort to give everyone an opportunity to, to, to participate in addressing the climate challenge. You as a country decide what it is you want to do, uh, but there's a framework within which you have to work, which should progressively make your NDCs more and more ambitious over time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leon, for, for shedding some light on that mysterious triplet of letters NDC and giving us some background there as well as to how they came about, what they mean for countries. And of course, what by extension then they also mean for the business community within these countries and, and in, in this case also the, the region. To bring a bit of life to the NDCs and how they exactly look within the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States member states and the wider Caribbean, may I hand over to you, Crispin, for your presentation, please? To and good day, everyone. Greetings. So I'm going to pre present a brief overview of the OECS first nationally determined contributions. That is the contributions of Antigua and Barbuda, Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And these NDCs were submitted in 2015, just ahead of the historic Paris, um, Paris meeting, out of which we got the Paris Agreement. So 
our OECS NDCs typically contain a combination of the following. They normally have an, out, have an outline of the, of the national or the policy context. <clears throat> they provide a base year from which they're starting. In other words, the targets are set against a given year. So it could be like 2014 or 20, 2006 or something like that. So against which they compare, the, you know, with which they, they look at the milestones. Uh, typically a review period, Leon had mentioned five years, 10 years. They would have greenhouse gas emissions baselines. In other words, how much greenhouse, you know, what quantity of greenhouse gases have they been emitting and so on. They would have, most of them have overall reductions targets. In other words, countrywide, we will reduce our emissions by X, Y, Z, or and somehow sectoral emissions targets where they might see the in the forestry sector or in, in the agriculture sector or in, in the transport sector. They will also outline adaptation needs or targets. Now, just a reminder that when you hear the word mitigation and climate change, that is reducing the, the sources of greenhouse gases or increasing the absorption of greenhouse gases. And adaptation is dealing with the impacts that are of climate change. And um, they, they would have, most of them have some cost information and some of them also have clarifications, limitations and conditions. So in, if we got to mitigation, that is emissions reductions, the key sectors were energy, power, in particular the electricity sector, and then the transport sector, which is, you know, which is also, well, which, which, is, which uses significant amounts of energy. But there was also um, reference to, to water, to land use and forestry, to waste management, and to agriculture. And I'm not going to go through all of these targets here, but just to give an example. So Antigua and Barbuda, the, the mitigation targets included, for example, by 2020, efficiency standards for the importation of all vehicles and appliances and achieve an energy matrix with 50 megawatts of electricity with, from renewable sources on and off grid in public and private sectors. Dominica, Dominica had a countrywide target. They said that they would reduce the absolute um, emissions by 17.9% of, of 2014 levels by 2020, 39.2 by 2025, and 44.7 by 2030. Um, Kitts, 22% of business as usual. Now, business as usual is basically looked at the, at the anticipated trajectory. In other words, if you're taking no measures at all, and then look at, you know, and say, okay, all right, if I would have increased by, say, 5% you know, by 2025, if you're know, looking at my projections and scenarios, then I'd reduce by that, you know, by the business as usual, as opposed to what your, your baseline was. And um, St. Lucia also looked, had a BAU or business as usual total by, of 16% by 2025 and 23% of versus BAU by 2030. And St. Vincent, 22% of BAU by 2025. Grenada also had, had a, 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 a country, had a overall total of 30% of 2010 by 2025 and 40% reduction of emissions of 2010, 2010 by 2030. And that was indicative. Now, we looked at, we looked at um, the, we looked at the, the, the cost, the, the sector targets. So again, and, and Tegan and Barbie, they looked at energy, health, tourism, agriculture, waste, and so on. And the estimated cost of implementing this for 2030 was 220 million US dollars. Dominica Energy Industries, um, transport, manufacturing, commercial, residential, and so on. And the cost of that was 99 million through 2013. Grenada was looked at electricity, transport, waste, forestry, and the total was 161 million through 2025. St. Kitts looked at energy in terms of geothermal, solar, wind, waste, energy efficiency, transport, but they didn't still have a specific cost at the time. Energy, um, for St. Lucia was energy efficient buildings, energy efficient appliances, water distribution and network efficiency, noting that water is one of the water sector is one of the biggest consumers of electricity in that country. Electricity generation, looking at a 35% renewable energy target by 2025 and 50% by 2030 based on a mix of geothermal, wind and solar. Improvements to grid distribution and transmission. Transport would look at efficient vehicles, improved and expanded public transit. And the cost was 218 million to 2030. And St. Vincent and the Grenadines looked at energy, mainly renewable energy, um, energy efficiency, and transport. And the reference to LULU CFA's land use 
land use change and forestry, which typically looks at, for example, reforestation and avoiding deforestation and so on. Now, with respect to adaptation, the key sectors were water, coastal zone, agriculture and food security, the built environment, human health, and tourism. Now, most countries did not have specific targets because at the time when the Caribbean in general, CARICOM, was looking at the whole issue of NDC's nationally determined contributions, the, the primary focus for us was at the time um, when we were negotiating uh, was mitigation and trying to limit um, the, 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 in, the increase in temperature to under 1.5 degrees. That was always our, our objective. And those of you who were in the negotiating trenches or were following, with, remember the slogan, 1.5 to stay alive. But Antigua and Barbuda was looking at, for example, increasing seawater desalination capacity by 50% above 2015 levels. Um, by 2030, all buildings improved and prepared for extreme climate events and so on. Dominica was looking at addressing climate change mitigation measures, saving in energy costs to allow um, investment in more priority and much needed adaptation measures, establishing community of grid mini grid and so on, promotion of food security for climate risk, resilient agriculture and fisheries. Grenada was enhancing institutional frameworks, building coastal resilience, improving water resource management. You'll notice, as I indicated, that the costing was not provided in most instances because in, there was a lot of narrative about adaptation to mention its importance, but they had, there was not, you know, there were very few adaptation targets. And I think people had, really, most countries had not really wrapped their heads around what adaptation targets they want to see. Um, San Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis forestry and terrestrial ecosystems, water resources, human settlements, and so on. St. Lucia was looking at adaptation facilitation, that's for national policy, legislation, and, and, and institutional frameworks, public education, and so on. Adaptation implementation through climate resilience measures in critical buildings, coastal zone management, community and national level interventions, food security, building codes. St. Vincent was looking at agriculture, forestry, and fisheries, coastal zone, human health, and water resources. Now, what is the cost of implementing the NDCs now? Antigua for, and Barbuda was looking at um, was an estimated cost of 220 million. Dominica, 99 million, that's mitigation. 161 million for Grenada. St. Kitts, no figure. St. Lucia, 218 million, and that's US dollars. St. Vincent, no cost. So for the figures, so we ended up with 698 plus plus. And Antigua was the only country, and Barbuda, sorry, was the only country that came in with um, a figure of 200 million um, for, based on the adaptation targets. And I have to say that most of the countries, at the time I was working with the government of St. Lucia, we had to, we had a relatively short time to prepare our NDCs. We, some sectors were not included, and in some cases, it was not possible to get all the costings. And um, in hindsight, we, we most of us believe that the figures that we provided were underestimated. So some points to consider with regard to the NDCs. All OECS NDCs state that targets are conditional on external support. In other words, countries can't do this from their own national budgets or for their own effort, and they'll need external support. And um, whether public, private, or what have you. To date, member states as a whole are not yet on track to meet the NDC targets. Most countries are not anywhere near meeting their 2025 targets, far as 2030. And member states are currently revising or preparing to revise the NDCs to formulate more ambitious ones as per the Paris Agreement ahead of COP26. And because Leon indicated that we have, more, um, we have to submit successive and more ambitious NDCs as you go along. So in, in closing, um, some, some concluding points. So OECS NDCs can be considered fairly ambitious and reflect the desire to address the collective of climate change by contributing to the global climate effort. And I think, as Leon said, these NDCs have become a, a cornerstone of national planning because countries are using this to build their resilience and to transition to more resilient, to, to low carbon economies and to reduce their, their, their dependence on, on um, fossil fuels. In the next round of NDCs, we can expect more ambitious emissions targets in, among others, power, transport, and water and um, also clearer definition of adaptation ambition and probably more specific targets with associated, associated costings because a lot of countries have been doing national adaptation plans and so on. And um, they, so these would provide a little more granularity and allow people to plug in, countries to plug in more detail into the NDCs, the second NDCs. Yeah, the NDCs must be viewed in the context of wider climate ambition in the OECS region. 
for example, the UK OECS, the UK overseas territories, they do not submit autonomous indices being, being um, because you know they, they, they are not independent and are not independently part of, of the convention and the Paris Agreement. But they are also interested in taking meaningful climate action. Of course, the costings were not in, included in, in those I gave earlier. There are opportunities also for regional action on common issues and consideration has previously been given to collaborative or regional and regional implementation of common NDC elements, including aspects of water and transport. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Crispin, for, for putting some life into that and, and, and what all of that looks like in the Caribbean. And I think very clear that these are national um, commitments, but of course, affecting a lot of industries. So um, even those of you from those industries who may not have heard of the NDCs before will have probably perked up your ears at this point. Because of course it affects wide sections of, of society and certainly much of, of um, the economy across the, across the region. Um, so this whole question of how to get key actors on board for effective implementation of the NDCs but also how to obviously get critical funding for this implementation is something that the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States and the government of St. Lucia have jointly been looking at for a while in the context of the NDC Finance Initiative. Um, and Annette, the floor is yours to give us a little bit of background on what we have been doing there so far. Again, with the, with the ask to stick to the 10 minutes because time seems to be ticking away very quickly. Maybe one quick um, uh, remark on the, on the questions. We've seen the first questions coming into the Q&A. Please feel free to do so as we go along. We have people looking at them as we go through, but we're also obviously happy to start collecting questions that we'll be discussing as a, as a group later on. Annette, the floor is yours. Annette, we can't hear thank you. you yet. Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much, Lina. And let me say thanks to my um, colleagues who presented before for setting the stage. Um, Leon and Crispin gave us a very good um, outlook in terms of the global and the regional um, perspectives as it relates to um, NDCs within the Caribbean. So basically, OECS member states have these NDCs or some form of um, climate commitments. But the big question was, how do we translate them into meaningful actions? Do we do this as um, individual countries or was there a chance that we could work together? Um, could we pool resources, including our expertise and tap into opportunities that presented themselves? Did we have to explore opportunities that were not obvious and did we unlock, how do we unlock these um, opportunities? Um, another question was, how do we champion and drive NDC implementation um, in the region? So some of these are some of the questions and thoughts that we had on, on our minds when the UNFCCC approached the government of St. Lucia and the OECS Commission together in 2017. And these same questions existed even when the NDC partnership came on board to help us to see how we could find um, you know, sensible answers um, to these um, very questions. What happened thereafter? Um, the government of St. Lucia, together with the OECS Commission, decided to have a wider conversation, conversation with the rest of the OECS member states to determine what the state of play was as it pertained to um, the implementation of their NDCs. What challenges were they seeing? What was needed? Um, what ideas did they have in mind for some meaningful implementation um, on the ground? I mean, after all, as Leon indicated, we made these commitments. And yes, we said, you know, our NDCs were conditional. We can do this if we get help with X and Y. But at the end of the day, the help will not always come directly to us. So we had to be creative in what we, um, we needed to achieve. So basically, this conversation that we had with the other OECS member states um, pointed to the need for a central or a regional mechanism that would allow um, member states to focus on strategic implementation of their NDCs, of the commitments that they made. Um, we needed to, we looked at how we could unlock the resources that we needed um, to lead to transformative actions that can contribute to national development or building resilient um, economies. And I always remember folks that <laughs> this conversation took place just as um, Hurricane Irma 
started wreaking havoc on our islands and we did not need um, another reminder of exactly um, what we needed to do in terms of coming together, meaningful collaboration to take effective action to continue preserving our island nations. And so with all of this, one year after, we had our first NDCFI forum hosted here in St. Lucia in October of 2018, and we had very good ministerial representation and participation. This conversation that we had, what did we look at? First of all, we looked at the barriers that pre um, presented themselves to NDC implementation in the region, the national, the regional, the international um, barriers, the political, financial, the institutional, the legislative barriers that we were confronted with. We look at the obligations as well that we were already committed to and knowing fully well that we were taking on new um, challenges. We looked at how um, we could prepare ourselves for enhanced NDC um, revision. Leon spoke about this earlier. Can we increase our ambitions and how? And what did we need to do this? We had some frank discussion with development partners who were present. Um, we looked at engaging them, not just for the short term, but the long term. We looked at what their concerns and expectations were as they were being brought on board um, to basically support what to them could have been something very new and different. And we, we, fig we tried to figure out you know, how they were willing to support, how they could support, what conditions there were for them um, to support this drive. One of the things we also discussed was the establishment of network. This is very important. And this was not just with our development partners, but at the technical level, and I will touch briefly in a little bit in terms of our working group um, network that we were able um, to establish. So coming out of the first forum in 2018, we saw that there was a need for a stronger political presence and commitment for NDC implementation. And one of the outputs from the forum was the development of and signing of a ministerial declaration which, which helped to pave the way um, for the work of the NDCFI going forward. Another thing that, thing that was clear is that effort is needed to integrate climate change and NDC into overall national planning. Some countries might have a more structured approach in terms of NDC implementation, but generally we felt that NDC, the NDC process needed to be better coordinated and streamlined within the various agencies and work programs of the, um, the respective countries. And it was also felt that there was a need um, to develop more cohesive policies that would support or be more consistent with NDC um, implementation. And one other thing that was very important that was um, debated during the first forum as well, was the issue of data monitoring and evaluation systems that needed strengthening um, throughout the region. Again, in some instances, as we go through the NDC revision process, this is a challenge that some countries are trying to manage. <clears throat> so the first forum gave a better sense of member states' position, a better understanding of our development partners' interests, the gaps, et cetera, that we had to focus on. And so we were able to develop a vision that would allow us to, um, first of all, operate in an open and inclusive manner um, if we were to um, pursue collaboration that is aligned with the priorities that the member states determined were important to them. And to make sure that um, you know, we target the opportunities not only within the region, but outside of the region as far as possible. Um, also, we figured that um, within the vision, we needed to help to bridge the political commitments between the national and international spheres as, um, at the regional level, um, create a space for political um, discourse at the regional level, and make sure that our, lead our leaders remain active. I mean, after all, um, in 2017, coming out of the OECS Council of Ministers meeting, a mandate was given to the OECS to spearhead a regional action or um, NDC implementation. So this was quite in keeping with the, um, the vision that we um, developed. And of course, we see ourselves um, working with member states to improve the various um, frameworks relevant to NDC implementation. So this kind of vision is allowing us to find creative ways to encourage and to facilitate a new type of conversation between governments, 
the private sector development partners. And I know there's a space for everybody who is interested and committed, you know, to ensuring or um, to seeing that the region make um, some progress in this regard. So with this vision and with all the discussions that we've had, with all the collaboration, with all the, the, the network and partnership that we've been able to build, what has happened thus far with regard to the NDC FI's um, ability to ensure that there have been some achievements with all of the efforts that have been put into um, this initiative. Um, going into the first forum, we were able to develop working groups and Crispin spoke about the various sectors that were focused on in the individual um, NDCs of the various countries. So this, these working groups that were formed were mainly created um, to have a space and to bring the technical voices of our experts within the region, um, to bring their voices to the NDCFIs. These working groups provide um, peer support across the water, energy, transport, and other critical infrastructure um, sectors. And we have an expert from each country sitting within each group. And I'm happy to provide more information. And of course, if you're from one of the OECS member states and you're sitting within, for example, our finance or our economic development agencies, we would love to have a conversation with you. We'd love to hear from you because we want to expand the reach of our working groups in order to ensure that all the critical issues, all the critical sectors are represented as the, the NDCFI um, moves forward. Another area in which NDCFI has grown since its um, inception and this I can speak to is with regard to its ability to increase private sector engagement. And this is one of the reasons why we're here um, today for that matter. We embrace the private sector as a key stakeholder. We see its importance in helping to effectively address climate change in the region. And with this in mind, we developed a dedicated NDCFI private sector engagement strategy and action plan. And essentially this plan proposes a, a practical way um, to include the, the, or to further integrate the private sector as a key element under the NDCFI because we see that there is potential to enhance climate action and increase climate investment. We remain mindful that the nature of the Caribbean um, private sector is very different from that of developed countries. Um, we also developed a regional needs climate um, finance strategy. And this basically shows us how to capture existing climate finance flows, how to mobilize and accelerate investment and address the barriers that I spoke to um, earlier. We remain committed to this process and we have seen some successes in addition to member states benefiting from um, capacity building and peer exchange um, opportunities through the working groups and also technical supports for the development of project concepts um, for submission to the GCF and the adaptation fund, for example, and I believe four countries in all have benefited in this regard. We had a second forum um, in the making, but COVID had other um, plans, um, but our planning efforts were definitely shaping up to be something much bigger and better um, from what we were seeing. There have been challenges, but we remain motivated because in the relatively short journey of the NDCFI, we've met some friendly partners um, who believe in what we're doing. We're making the same attempts in their region um, where their countries have the same vulnerabilities, same challenges. And an example of this is the NDC hub for the, um, the Pacific Islands. We were fortunate to partner with them during COP of last year. We remain uh, motivated as we forge ahead. We have partners who believe um, in supporting the NDCFI in the past who have shown commitment to our current undertakings and um, they remain um, mot um, motivated to continue supporting us because they believe that with our limited resources, there is potential, there is hope for us to continue towards making this kind of transformative change to build our resilient economies. And you will hear from one of our partners later on. So basically the IMF thinks the NDCFI forum should be used as a means for articulating a strategy for climate financing and the Paris Committee on capacity building sees it as an opportunity um, to have a regional mechanism for NDC implementation. This by no means is the solution to the, the, the challenges that we face with NDC implementation in the region. Um, but it is with this kind of thought in mind that we look forward at the earliest opportunity 
to host in St. Lucia the second NDCFI forum, <laughs> which we should, which should have taken place this month actually. But as soon as we're able to do that, we're going to be showcasing the growth of the NDCFI. We're going to be further engaging our investors. We're going to be building more partnerships, bringing more persons on board, and to continue to demonstrate, you know, collective leadership towards achieving our NDC targets. So we are anticipating that as soon as we're able to host this second event, that you are going to be part of this. What we hope what we know is going to be a magnificent um, event within the Caribbean um, with the view in mind of ensuring that we continue to work together, collaborate together, find strategic partnerships and meaningful ways of implementing our NDCs within the regions. We made the commitment. We need to remain committed. We need to show that in as much as we're a small island states, we have the potential to overcome these challenges and to manage them. So with that in mind, folks, I thank you very much for your attention and I hand back over to you. Thank you very much, um, Annette, for, for, I think, a very interesting account of what we've been doing so far and a very hopeful outlook as to what we will be achieving in the next little while. Um, whilst we come to our presentation of, our, um, of Raquel Moses from the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator, who will give us a bit more of a view on, on some of the work that they've been doing, and of course, also, I think, speak to this whole question of engaging broadly, of engaging cross sectors, which is actually also something that has come up in the questions already. How do we make sure that everybody go, gets, gets involved in this, in this whole process? How do we get there? We also wanted to just test the waters a little bit with you and um, get your inputs, and I'm sharing the poll now, on what you think the impact of the current crisis is on climate action among businesses, particularly in the, in the region. I think we're seeing a lot of discussion around that. Is this the kind of white wake up call um, that we, well, maybe didn't need, but that will nevertheless help us really accelerate climate action? Is it an opportunity maybe even to create some of the much needed jobs by investing in resilient and low carbon infrastructure right now, um, as many other things are on pause? Is it an opportunity to reset business models, really focus on this whole question of resilience more generally? Or on the other hand, is it a real setback to the focus on climate action as priorities shift, as budgets are stretched? Do we see no major change? Or is it maybe just too, too early to tell? So um, whilst I give you a couple more minutes to, to give us your responses on that, um, Raquel, do you already want to pull up your slides maybe? Then we can dive straight into your presentation after that. Looks like no one seems to think there is no major change. Maybe that was a bit of a, of a cheeky response option to even put in there, since this seems to be changing everything at the moment. I still see numbers rising quite quickly, uh, slowing down. Last 10 seconds to put your response in. There you go. Hang on, share results, sorry, technology. Right, so I think them, most of you are really looking at this as an opportunity to reset business models, take a new look at the importance of, it, of resilience. Um, quite a number of people are also seeing this as an opportunity for job creations in the types of investment areas that we've known for a while we need to be looking at as well. But of course, there are also a number of people who have concerns around shifting priorities and, and, and budgets. Thank you very much for, for giving us a bit of a test of the, of the waters on that. That's very helpful. And with that, it's over to you, Raquel, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Lena. And um, thank you so much to the other speakers who really uh, did a wonderful job of laying the groundwork of how we would, what the nationally determined contributions are and how we plan to build a more resilient economy on top of that. As introduced, my name is Raquel Moses. I'm the CEO of the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator. We were formed in an effort to create cohesive climate action across the region. So as Annette was talking about sort of getting leaders to move in the same direction and to um, move together, uh, that is exactly what we were formed for. So our objective is to do a couple of things. It is first to prioritize the implementation of the nationally determined contributions 
to find ways to bring in private capital and to bring in philanthropy to be able to address uh, investment in the implementation. So to bring new capital that the region is, isn't already accessing, to be able to assist in fast tracking the implementation of the nationally determined contributions. Um, it is to bring innovation to the table by working with a number of different partners across the region and across the globe who are inventing new solutions and get them piloted in the region. And it is also to um, bring the private sector in so that we, we allow government to focus on what they do best, which is policy, and that we help the private sector to, um, to work on implementation so that we create mm -hmm. business opportunities out of the implementation of the nationally determined contributions. So those are the things that we do, uh, specifically build blended financial portfolios exactly that can help to finance our nationally determined contributions. But before we, we get into sort of um, what some of the specific opportunities are, I think it's really important for us to understand who's out there. So, so I'd really like to know um, who are the, where, what industries you represent in terms of, of, of your, your participants. So if you could just let us know what industry you're in. And that will help me to be able to uh, tailor the information in terms of what the opportunities are specific to your industry and just to understand who's represented. I see we have a lot of people uh, in climate change, a lot in consulting, legal marketing and communications, lots in government, some in hospitality, tourism, and transportation, uh, some in IT. My entire background is IT, so, so welcome to the IT folks. And we have some people in other. We also have some folks in agriculture. Um, we have a little over 50% of, of everyone having voted, but lots in, in consulting and lots in climate change, which is excellent. And we'll give it a couple more seconds. Um, but I do want, as we were talking about, as Annette had sort of introduced the concept of getting leaders to be on the same page and to lead with purpose on how the NDCs are implemented, to commend the OECS on the leadership that they have demonstrated uh, since the Paris Agreement, uh, to be able to help countries to work together on the implementation of their NDCs because I really think that they are doing a phenomenal job of bringing us all together and ensuring that um, that we are paying attention. So most of the people here are from climate change, so we're speaking to the audience, uh, speaking to the choir, speaking to the choir essentially. So thank you all so much. So just to be able to set a bit of the scale as to what we're talking about this morning is, you know, if we t think about the um, the GDP of the region, right? So the GDP, not just of the Caribbean, but the Caribbean and Latin America, we're talking about $10.5 trillion, right? And that's by 2018 figures. If we look at the study by the new climate economy, and the, the link will be in the chat for the study on the new climate economy, they suggested that we would need 26 trillion to, to uh, in terms of the benefit by 2030 to be able to meet the requirements and um, to implement what's necessary for climate change. Morgan Stanley, on the other hand, and the link will be in the chat as well, uh, is predicting that we need 50 trillion by 2050 uh, to be able to just meet across five areas to meet the commitments, and this is the 2015 commitments of the nationally determined uh, contributions. And they say the five areas are renewable energy, carbon capture, electric vehicles, biofuels and hydrogen as the five areas of, of areas for investment. Um, and back in, in uh, 2010, which is, you know, it seems like a lifetime ago, uh, the World Bank did a study that suggested that the Caribbean needed to invest 22 billion into adaptation. And we have found already about $8 billion on a very, very conservative uh, outlook in terms of projects that require um, implementation. So all of that to say that the scale of what we talk, we're talking about is incredibly huge. When you look at it globally or even regionally, it's incredible. And the challenge that we are seeing is that countries are thinking too small. Individuals and businesses are thinking too small, and we really need to start focusing on the big picture. So the primary objective of the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator 
is to build our economic resilience on this issue of climate change. So to create more jobs in the sector, to create more exports in the sector, to create more financial freedom in the sector, and to focus on those things. Because when the storms come, and, and for example, the cost of the damage in Dominica from Hurricane Maria was 226% of their GDP. In addition to the fact that we cannot afford to do that, even under the best of circumstances, um, that we definitely need to figure out how we turn this vulnerability into an economic opportunity. And one of the, the very few silver linings of COVID-19 is that it fast tracks that because we now need to figure out how we fast track our economies to be able to respond to the shutdown. So what we're seeing is there's a gap in terms of the spending that needs to happen to meet the nationally determined contributions and to no fault of the countries because there just isn't the fiscal space. Uh, so we're also seeing, as, as uh, Crispin had mentioned, a lot more focus on mitigation than adaptation. When we think about the Caribbean's contribution uh, being to, to uh, greenhouse gases, it's less than 2% of the global greenhouse output. So our focusing on mitigation, while noble, doesn't make much of a difference in the grand scheme of things. And, and uh, Leon Charles had mentioned it as well, that the largest emitters aren't necessarily, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing wildly, you know, they're not necessarily stepping up to the plate. So while it is admirable for us to focus on mitigation and, and absolutely imperative because we need to speak from a position of strength and from a position of uh, do what we do, what we do not do what we say. But we have to focus on adaptation as well. The challenge is the cash flows are in mitigation. So when you think about things like, you know, the cost of diesel generation versus the cost of renewable energy, it's a lot more expensive to generate electricity prior to the recent slump in oil prices uh, using renewable energy versus diesel generation. So we have to think about what are some of the ways that we can innovatively finance this transition that we have to, that we have to make. The other thing that we're seeing a lot of is that a lot of international companies are focused on the region, focused on providing solutions, focused on us using their new technologies, focused on seeking business opportunities out of the region. And I think they are using this as an opportunity to build their competence, even if their solutions are nascent and, and they're still developing. Um, they want to, to, to access the region. We absolutely need to focus on accessing our own region first. Charity starts at home. And so the businesses that we build and um, the, the, the innovation that we create we need to start and use it in the region, but we also need to be looking at an external audience, looking at international uh, exports as a, as a source of, of additional revenue. Uh, finally, at the Accelerator, we, we absolutely demand local content for any of the suppliers that we work with. And we have a supplier registry that we're building. So as we work with countries, we can share with them these are the regional suppliers who are able to provide services in these areas because we think it's absolutely important uh, not to have suppliers that sort of come in, deliver a solution and leave, that they create jobs and transfer know-how. And so in the link, you should find um, a supplier registration uh, link where you can go in if there are services that you have available to provide. So as we interact with the 26 governments that make up our coalition, we can share with them the companies that are doing business in the region that are providing services along the lines of their requirements that are regional. So what this, sh what this shows is the gap. We did a gap analysis back in January, I believe it was. And there's about $2.5 billion in unspent but available capital to meet the requirements of um, where companies have committed versus where, sorry, where countries have committed versus where they, what they have spent. And so we definitely need to see those, those opportunities 
being taken up. So $2.5 billion in available um, investment from these governments to put into their climate adaptation and, and mitigation ambitions. So our short-term goals are, are simple. One is to make sure that we are seeking an international audience for all that we do so that our products and services, we have so many um, free trade agreements that are just not uh, have not materialized because we haven't operationalized them. That we, we get these agreements and then our, our suppliers cannot or do not access those markets. So we need to make sure that we are accessing the markets that are available to us and using that as an opportunity to grow. We were also uh, focused on, we've received a donation to create a climate smart map. So it is to align, as, as Leon and Kristen and, and, and Annette would have shared, to align what we are all doing to make sure that, okay, if the ambition of the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator is to get us all to the point of creating the world's first climate smart zone by acting together to reach the objectives of our nationally determined contributions, then what does that look like in terms of the level of investment that's required and um, how we can fund those things using philanthropic capital, but using philanthropic capital to leverage either loan, in, loan money or, or grant money or other kinds of money that can then help to get us over the edge. How can we get countries to how can we create economies of scale to get countries to work together so that we're always working from the perspective of best practice? And then um, how can we um, use all of those things to define our endpoint as much as we can so that it's clear how are we making progress towards those goals? I thought it was um, really interesting when Leon had mentioned that some of the ambitions um, in 2015 were weak. We did a desk study uh, at, the, at some point last year, where we were looking at the commitments across the region, across the 26 countries that we represent. And the countries, some of the countries that had made some of the more, um, you know, cautious, um, cautious objectives in terms of their nationally determined contributions were actually the ones that were closer to meeting them. So that, that there may be some sensibility because there were some countries when they had made their commitments, I was a bit disappointed. I said, you know, they should have pushed further. They should have gone deeper. They could have done more. But I think that builds up their competence a little bit if they say, okay, I'm go my goal is 30% and you meet it. And then you say, okay, now it's 45% and you meet it versus going, my goal is 100% and then not meeting that goal by the deadlines that are set. So we are seeing a bit of a mixed bag, but in about 45% of the cases across the countries that we represent, we are seeing strategic action taking place. But that does mean that in 55% of the cases, we are not seeing sufficient action. We're not seeing um, RFPs being issued. We're not seeing policies being changed. We're not seeing um, new solutions being put in place. And we're not seeing those things happening on a timeline to allow them to meet their commitments. Um, we're also looking at uh, a partnership with a company called Literati. And what they do is they document um, waste that you find across the place. And, and a, a phenomenal example of, of how they work is um, they had, you know, you use your smartphone and you take a picture of the litter that you find and it goes into a database to geolocate that, that waste. But it also tags that waste to say, this is from this particular company. And they had an exercise that they did in, in California. And they were able to introduce a tax on particular, on cigarette products, for example, because there was so much cigarette waste on the ground across the place. And they could prove it, which previously you weren't able to do. But what this can help us to do, and what we think that this would be sort of a strategic move for us, is to help us identify where is the waste coming from and to help to hold those, those companies accountable and have them participate in finding solutions. So for example, there was an exercise where a school had used the app and they noticed that 80% of the waste around the school was from Taco Bell soft packets and most of them were unopened. And so they went to Taco Bell with the data and that particular Taco Bell no longer sells, gives out the packets of sauce. They now 
have dispensers so that if you want some sauce, you get some sauce, but if you don't want it, it's not going to become a little problem in the neighborhood. So, so we're seeing sort of innovations like that helping us to find ways to raise capital to address the issues that we're seeing. So all of that to say that we shouldn't wait for the right opportunity, that we should create it, and that um, the, the, the opportunity is ripe for us to start addressing uh, some of these issues. So w when we look at, at innovators and pioneers, there's Angela Rainford, who is um, the managing director of Rem Reckonmar, I, I never know how to pronounce that, but she's, she's the pioneer of Paradise Solar Farm in Jamaica. And she was able to put together a solution for this solar farm that um, is now creating energy at a lower kilowatt per hour than Jamaica has, has seen in modern history. And, and her story is quite incredible. The link is in the, is in the chat for, for Angela's story about how she created this opportunity, bringing people together and, and putting this solution together in Jamaica. Um, so when we look at, and the biggest opportunity we're seeing is definitely in renewable energy. So for example, if you look at the last set of commitments in terms of renewable energy, uh, so Aruba had, uh, is at 15% now with a target of 100%. Belize is at 54% with a target of 85% and so on and so forth. And so for most of the countries, all except for Suriname, which is ahead of their target and Costa Rica who have met their target, there is a gap for each of these countries. So if you're looking at renewables, for example, uh, we're talking to all of these countries, we're looking at, okay, what are the projects that you have in place to help you to get to your goals? by the time frame that you've defined, and what are the gaps that exist in terms of projects. And in each country, there are gaps that exist, and there is a willingness to close that gap, that, that gap by getting additional projects uh, on board. So that is a key opportunity that we see, not only in each of your individual countries, but also across the region, to start looking more broadly at where um, you know, renewable energy meeting that target of renewable energy is necessary. Um, also, Taji Allen, and again, the link would be in the chat, uh, has put together Treasure Beach Hydroponic Farms. Um, what they do is hydroponic farming, again, part of climate adaptation, growing is going to be more and more difficult. And so uh, looking at vertical farming or hydroponic farming um, would be something that we definitely want to see more of. When we look across our portfolio of projects, we have far more, I'd say 85 to 95% are mitigation versus uh, about 10% um, for, for adaptation. So we need to see more adaptation work taking place across the region. Uh, Johan and Dunant, Dujon, sorry, who founded Aldus Organics, he's in St. Lucia, and he's doing some magnificent things, turning Sargassum into uh, fertilizer. And so again, we want to see more projects like this. And, and we've been linking him with different sources of funding so that he can move his project forward. And then if we're looking globally, there is Jessica Matthews of Uncharted Power. Um, she created a ball, a football, that you can kick around and the motion of kicking the football around then can produce, provide a charging port, a, a a charging port that you then can plug devices into. So for places where there isn't power or for places where there isn't enough power, this is a magnificent solution. And you know, just such a, such a stroke of brilliance, um, it's something that we're seeing on the international stage. And then there's J Jaheel Oliver, who is uh, of Caribbean descent, um, and Hello Tractor. So what we're seeing in terms of uh, resilient agriculture is that some small farmers don't have access to buying a tractor. But this is almost like the Uber of, of tractors, where you, you use your app and you rent a tractor for the period of time that you need to use it, but you don't have to own a tractor to be able to move forward. So these are some of the innovative solutions that we're seeing, and, and we're really excited about the potential of, of projects like these.
So we've been working with uh, UNDP uh, and IVO Capital, and I'll tell you a little bit about. So UNDP is building a fund for small entrepreneurs to be able to raise capital for climate-specific uh, projects. The challenge that they're having is that they created this fund for small investments because what would typically be a small investment somewhere else doesn't apply to us. Our investments are even smaller. So they said, okay, we'll do small, small investments of a million US, um, a million US or, or more. And we have not seen yet uh, entrepreneurs coming to us that can facilitate a million US investment. So still our projects are too small and they're not necessarily built to scale very, very widely. So what we're having to do in working with UNDP is to find multiple entrepreneurs to put into a $1 million investment opportunity that then becomes a part of their fund to put small deals together. So the administration that's required for a $100,000 investment versus a $1 million investment is almost identical. So the cost of putting it together can be quite challenging when the numbers are too small. So a lot of times, you know, I say to, to audiences, the challenge that we see is not investors or not entrepreneurs asking for too much money, but far too little money. And so we need to be able to think about how we create solutions that have the ability to scale, because that's really, really important. We're also working with IVO Capital Partners because they're building a venture debt instrument uh, that will apply to the region. And so what it does is it provides, um, similar to venture capital, but this is a, a loan, but it's, it's venture debt, um, that you have the ability to access as an entrepreneur working in climate. And so these are the kinds of opportunities that we're seeing cropping up. So when you think about um, uh, all of the, the opportunities that exist, and, and certainly we think about IDB as lending to national governments, but IDB is also available from IDB Invest to work with uh, entrepreneurs as well as with uh, small businesses to provide loans. And COVID-19 has helped them create some fast track processes that can now help to focus on climate action as well as on solutions that have the ability to create jobs because we need to get our economies back up and running. You know, it's a, a common thing that people used to say when, they, um, when the world has a, a cold, we have pneumonia. And so the impact on our economies is going to be dire unless we hit the gates running. And we have to think about tourism and things like that in a very, very different way. And we have to focus on diversification of our economies, not only for us to, to survive, but for us to thrive. So it's almost like we're on a slope and we no longer have the option of staying, staying still. We're either gonna push and move forward or we're gonna just slide back into, into nothingness. And we have to take a decision now that we are going to be pressing forward. So what are some of the projects uh, that we are actively working on or actively seeing as opportunities um, for, for companies to get involved in. Um, our first project that we implemented in Jamaica uh, is a clean drinking water project. It's an adaptation project, which is fantastic. Um, it is a panel called a source panel, and it uses sunlight and air to create an independent drinking water supply. And we have about three or four other projects like this that we're about to implement. So we fundraise for the project and we work with uh, a location to get the project implemented. And this is displacing um, over 11.5 million plastic bottles, but it's also creating resilience in a children's ward at the University of the West Indies Hospital which we're really incredibly um, encouraged by. So um, as I mentioned, solar, solar is huge and almost every single country across the region has a nationally determined contribution that has some dependence on solar. Energy efficiency, in order for these countries to right size their grids, they need to work on renewable, but they also need to work equally on energy efficiency. As we start to bring transportation onto the grid, that will help them to uh, create a, a balanced load that then 
um, makes up the difference in terms of what they might lose. But energy efficiency is key. We can't continue to waste energy across the region. So solutions focused on energy efficiency is really, really big. Addressing sargassum. Um, sargassum, as things get warmer as a form of adaptation, sargassum is going to continue to be a problem. So we absolutely need to focus on sargassum. Uh, focusing on, on either indoor farming or more resilient farming, as, as we saw with Dominica, you know, the, the root vegetables were the ones that survived the last set of hurricanes. And so focusing on what are the things that we can, how can we make those things uh, more sensible? Electric vehicles is really big. Some countries have some really wildly ambitious, uh, ambitious goals as it relates to electric vehicles, but they have to figure out how to transition as well as, you know, the implementation of those solutions and simple things like charging ports and, and all of those things. The blue economy is huge. How we green our exports and how we create solutions that are greener that then gives us greater market access. How we do more with recycling. Those are, that's a really, really big area of growth and, and creating, um, creating more from uh, creating less waste. Uh, digital transformation. Uh, how, we, how we just fix our economies to be able to respond to this moment and the moments to come that will require us to, to work in a more online manner. And then adaptation. How do we, you know, you know we know what we're going to see. We're going to see more flooding. We're going to see more heat. We're going to see um, more food insecurity. So how can we prepare more solutions to address those issues? And those are active, active challenges that countries are facing that they are looking for solutions for. So those are some of the opportunities that we see. And um, I want to thank you so much because that's, that's the time. Thank you so much, um, Raquel, for a, a, a very informative presentation, reaching all the way from the kind of the bigger picture to some very concrete examples. I think that was very helpful. Um, Thank you also for sticking spot on to your time. Nevertheless, we've somehow managed to use a lot more time than we had planned. So unfortunately, we'll have to cut the Q&A a little bit short. But there's three questions, Raquel, that are, that are open right now. One is a quick one. Could you please share again the name of the company that records waste and geotags? It's called, it's called Literati. And we can put the, the link, we'll put the link in the chat, Literati. Perfect. Thank you very much yeah. for, for, for that. And, and maybe one other quick question around, or maybe it's not so quick, but, but maybe just a brief answer for now and, and a pointer to maybe further discussions on that then. Um, David Robin is, looking, is, is asking specifically around funding available for businesses that are looking to invest in offshore wind and wave energy. So he's looking for, um, he's looking for money for for investment in offshore wave and wind energy. Yes. Um, ask him please to send us an email at hello at uh, CaribbeanAccelerator.org. Uh, there are some specific, we are building a fund with USAID, CDB, IRENA, and some other partners to fund exactly these kinds of things. And what we want to be able to do is to remove the risk from it. So to provide some grant capital to help these projects get going to the point where they can attract uh, proper investment. So please send us an email at that address and we can have a, an offline conversation about how we how we help to find funding for something like that. Perfect. Thanks, Raquel, because that might be a question that in, in, in various um, variations might apply um, to other people as well. One of the things that you talked about, which I think is very relevant, obviously, for the, for the region, is this whole question around size and making, um, having projects that are, that are big enough. Um, but there's also, I guess, questions around things like um, encouraging asset sharing. Is that also something where you see possibilities for securing larger investments? That's also one of the questions that's coming in from the audience. Definitely, and we're seeing all kinds of uh, sort of asset sharing solutions or shared solutions. For example, um, I know a number of people are working on um, a Sargassa warning system and thinking about how do we share assets to remove Sargassa when we find out. So let's say there's an early warning system and we find out it's going to be on, on that particular beach. Um, so then there is a single asset that belongs to a group that can go and clean up the sargassum 
to preserve the, the levels of tourism, for example. So we see asset, asset sharing uh, tools and solutions as, as, a, as a great opportunity. Great, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your quick response on that. And I, I think, yeah, I think there's, that there, there's probably a lot to further explore on a lot of those issues. So I think what we, all we can probably t do today is initiate that conversation, really. I think um, as, the, as the NDC Finance Initiative, um, obviously, as Annette has said earlier, but also you guys, of course, I think what we are all aiming to do is kind of keep these platforms open experiment as we do with new ways of talking to each other and making sure we keep that communication going and we keep kind of getting all the voices and inputs that we need in order to, to, to keep driving at the speed that we need to drive despite the, the, the crisis right now or even all the, all the more so. Um, I, do, I don't know whether all of you can see that but in the Q&A you'll see that there's been a whole bunch of other questions which the colleagues have already um, responded to from things around including the health sector in NDCs, which of course in the, in the current context has a whole new, uh, taken on a whole new relevance. Um, generally, how engagement happens, um, whether we'll be sharing presentations and recordings, most of which is yes, um, and a whole number of other questions. So we will also be sharing those with you, um, as I don't think we have the, the luxury of time to go through all of them in, in detail right now. Um, I'm seeing one more open one coming in right now. Yes, contact information for all the speakers. I think um, we can be providing that as well for all of you, Raquel. I think I've already just briefly mentioned an email address we can we can contact, but we'll be sure to have we'll be sure to have all of that um, to you. Um, so, in the interest of time, and apologies as we're learning new mediums, we seem to have a harder time sticking to time commitments just yet. We're all learning. We'll get better, we promise. Dana? Yes. There's one last question in the chat, which I think um, is worth, you know, it should be given consideration. It's, it's for, this, it says, this is for Miss Moses. Can she identify funds for SMEs to invest in renewable energy and energy efficiency? Absolutely, absolutely. Please uh, email us at hello at Caribbean Accelerator. Um, there are some funds that are already available. Uh, certainly, uh, the IDB is, is looking at a number of different initiatives, uh, including putting together uh, what's called a super ESCO to be able to address energy efficiency. But in terms of renewable energy, we're building the fund, as I mentioned, with USAID, IRENA, and CDB, mm. as well as a number of other partners. And so we are actively uh, building our pipeline of projects at the moment. So it'd be great to, to hear about projects in need of funding. Great, thanks for picking that out of the, out of the chat, Chris, and really appreciate it. Um, and thanks for, for answering. And I think, yeah, again, I think a point or two, there will be a lot of follow-up discussions, which I think is a, is, is, a, is a good thing here. But given that we are now at 11.30, and I am aware that quite a number of you will have other commitments. I would like to now hand over to Alex to give us a bit of an outlook as to what we're planning next. The um, word matchmaking has been mentioned a number of times and Alex has some um, thoughts and ideas on what we can be doing there and how Getinvest has partnered with the NDC Finance Initiative in that um, context. Um, so Alex, you can start um, sharing your slides. We also were hoping to um, have one more poll where we wanted to get some of your inputs um, on some of the kind of key barriers around climate related investment um, and some of the key points where you feel there is demand for more action at the regional level. In the interest of time, I will put these up after Alex's presentation so that those of you who have to dash will not miss him. Alex, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Lena. I hope everybody can hear me well. Um, I have been listening very intently and have, uh, uh, I think we have had a very interesting webinar already. I um, want to applaud also uh, Mr. Charles and Ms. Moses for very engaging presentations um, that I found personally very interesting. I don't want to steal too much of your time. I just wanted to highlight two more things. Um, that I think uh, will uh, be very relevant going forward. If I could just ask Ms. Moses to uh, stop sharing her screen because then I can start sharing mine. No worries, thank you so much, Raquel. Um, 
I would, I would like to briefly introduce what Get Invest is, right? Because I know that Chamberlain was kind enough to mention it in the beginning, and uh, Lena has also mentioned it once or twice. So, um, Get Invest is um, a program, a European program, uh, hosted by the German international corporation agency GIZ, uh, that aims at supporting investments in decentralized renewable energies. So, what are decentralized renewable energies? Uh, to put it bluntly and very uh, frank, we are looking at the medium sized and smaller scale um, projects or so not so much the multi hundred megawatt uh, wind farms, but rather the small scale systems that, that are very relevant for local communities and have a very important role both in the uh, adaptation, but also mitigation um, in, of, of climate change. Um, I mean, adaptation, if you think about decentralized solar installations for um, you know, water pump resilience in, term, uh, in, in the event of flooding or other things, there, there are very interesting applications that um, are around. Um, the whole program is uh, funded uh, by the European Union and several member states, um, that's Germany, Sweden, the Netherlands and uh, Austria, and that it's hosted by GIZ, I've already mentioned. Um, what do we do? I mean, basically, we have two core components through which we uh, work. And the one is called private sector mobilization, where uh, in essence, we are trying to motivate the next uh, paradise solar farm to come together. I found that example from Jamaica uh, very good from uh, Ms. Uh, Rainford, who I think it was. Um, so this is all about you know, bringing people together to initiate new projects, additional projects in the region um, to yeah, um, reach these uh, ambition uh, mitigation targets uh, that we have seen in the uh, NDC presentations. And I think renewable energy uh, will play a very critical role uh, in, in that. Um, how do we do that? Um, we have a host of market information, business to business meetings about which in particular I will speak in a minute. Um, but also we work with associations uh, or institutions like the OECS and in this particular case, the NDC finance initiative and the second component is more about helping the existing projects to come to fruition and access finance. I think some of the questions we had in the chat uh, are very good examples, like where can I find financing for an SME driven renewable energy project? And many aspects come, come together here. That is the ticket size that Raquel already mentioned. Uh, many projects have small investment volumes that are too small for big international banks or the usual um, funder, funders that, that would fund renewable energy projects. Um, and we have a, a pool of technical assistance uh, advisors. One of them is actually uh, today with us, Valerie Dorel. Um, hi, Valerie, who's uh, participating today. And she's actually one of our regional advisors uh, doing that type of work. So um, another aspect often is, you know, you have a renewable energy project, um, you have been developing your project for, for months and you're, you're an engineer, you know, you're very confident on the technology side, you have a good site selected, you have good local networks, but on, on, you're not so, so strong on how to mobilize investment, you know, building a financial model, how to engage investors, how to mobilize investors. That's, that's something that is not your, 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 your core business. That's something where our advisors can help you and, and really reach what we always call bankability. It's a bit of a you know, cumbersome word, but it, it captures very nicely what this is all about, to help you reach investment. And um, <clears throat> one, one highlight that I wanted to, to share today is we do uh, B2B events. So one of these B2B events would have been the uh, Climate Finance Week that we were planning jointly with the NDCFI program to happen in uh, March this year that due to the ongoing pandemic had to be postponed. And um, we have been discussing with the NDCFI how we can, even under the conditions of the pandemic and the current lockdown, offer the participants in the sector, both companies, but also investors and funding programs and support uh, institutions like uh, the Climate Accelerator, a platform to exchange and still meet, although we are all at home and uh, we can't really travel. So um, I'm very happy to announce today that uh, on the 25th of June, we will actually, as Get Invest, host our first virtual event ever. Uh, it will be very similar to actually what we had today here. So you can expect a you know, couple of hours of uh, um, webinar program with um, 
different service providers presenting. That will be Get Invest. That will also be the uh, PubSafe program, which is another GIZ uh, program in the region that has very relevant uh, support services. Uh, I'm very happy to announce that we also uh, managed to get uh, confirmation from SECRI. So the Center for uh, the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency will also uh, be, be presenting their portfolio. Um, the European um, financing uh, program Electrify uh, will participate and present their services. Um, so we have a whole host of, of uh, very relevant uh, institutions and instruments for companies that are engaged in renewable energy project development. But in contrast to what we are doing today, at the end of the presentations, we're not all going back to our laptops and you know, joining back on the Outlook world and, and uh, doing our normal business. But we're actually hosting a virtual matchmaking session where you will be able to engage in one-on-one uh, -on -one video meetings with potential funders, uh, other participants, you know, companies, technology suppliers, service providers that, that uh, might become your new partner in your project. And uh, the way it works is on Monday, we will open the registrations for this particular event. You can go on the website, register, <coughs> pardon, set up a profile. So basically put in, you know, I do this and that. I'm looking for this and that. Like I'm looking for investment. I'm looking for a technology supplier. I'm looking for, you know, grant money for project development in the end, <coughs> whatever it might be. And then you peruse over the next two or three weeks all the other profiles that have registered be it investors, be it technology suppliers, and select people you want to meet. And then the whole, the platform will automatically arrange meetings for you that will take place after the webinar program. So basically, once the webinar program is done, each participant will have a set of one-on-one -on -one pre-arranged virtual uh, matchmaking meetings that uh, hopefully will uh, bring this all uh, further forward. And um, I don't want to spend too much time. I only I know I only have five minutes, so I could talk about this for a long time, but uh, I will keep it very short just to have mentioned this. Go on the website. I will also put it in the chat in a minute. Um, and I know that uh, the OECS and the NDCFI will also share uh, formal invitations on this uh, probably early next week. So uh, you will all not miss out on this. It's just an early teaser right now. Um, in addition to, to that, I would also like to briefly mention at least the, the further collaboration that we have with the NDCFI program. And that is on the already mentioned uh, project preparation work, our technical assistance work called the Get Invest Finance Catalyst, where we support projects in um, you know, accessing finance, getting to the point where, where they can talk to an investor. Um, all of this info is actually on our website, so I don't want to spend too much time on the individual uh, issues on the slide here. Just to show also for, for Crispin, because I know that Crispin is also eager to see the latest numbers uh, of, of our pilot work in the Caribbean because right now we are still in the pilot phase for this in the Caribbean. But right now we have uh, seven projects uh, that we support, three out of which are actually from St. Lucia. Um, and you, know, you, you see it all here. We have a, a whole uh, you know, swath of different business models. We have captive power projects too. We have two energy efficiency projects. Uh, we have two uh, independent power producers uh, and one uh, larger on-grid project in Barbados. Um, without much further ado, my last point, uh, given the current pandemic, we've also set up a very specific COVID-19 window under this finance catalyst work. So if you are a renewable energy business in the Caribbean, whose business is directly affected by the pandemic? So you have supply issues, you have business continuity issues. Um, go on our website. Uh, we have a specific free of cost advisory service that might be interesting for you. Um, the eligibility criteria are very straightforward. Um, we can offer a broad range of support in very short time. Um, and I can only encourage you to have a look at the website um, or reach out to me. I'm more than happy to link you up with the respective project manager working on this. Um, I think this is a very valuable service for uh, affected companies. Um, and without much further ado, um, thank you, Lena, for allowing me the, the time to speak and uh, giving me the chance to briefly present this. All of this will be presented in a bit more, uh, um, um, yeah, let's say, more broadly on the 25th of June on the upcoming event. Thank you all and uh, also congratulations to uh, Chamberlain, Crispin and Lena for hosting an excellent event. It was my pleasure to be your, your guest today. Thank you. Thank you very much, much, Alex. And, and uh, yeah, thanks again to all of you presenters who, from what the comments we're seeing come in, have done a really great job at, at answering a lot of questions. Um, 
I saw one question that, that just came in um, around um, entrepreneurs and seeing more entrepreneurs join these types of accelerators being answered already by Raquel in the chat. That's obviously something that Alex is speaking here to as well. But I'm um, seeing that some of you are obviously having to leave and, and, and very aware that we have taken 10 more minutes of your time than we promised we would. I think um, with that, we will probably close this session for today uh, with a promise to be, be back soon. We'll be back with a session to get, uh, together with Get Invest, but I suspect there'll be other opportunities um, as well. Uh, as you leave, may I nevertheless still put up our last um, poll where we were wanting to just get a little bit more of a sense on, on, on where you see some of the key things to do both for the for the governments but also for an initiative like the NDCFI where do you see um, significant barriers for climate related investments in the region where do you see some of the biggest demand for regional business engagement which will obviously also then guide our next steps and how we further plan engagement for the moment virtually and eventually hopefully also in person again but with that, once again, a big thank you to all the, the, the presenters. A big thank you, of course, especially also to Raquel Moses for joining us for the, from the Climate Smart Accelerator. And of course, to you, Alex, for giving us an outlook to, to next month. Thank you very much. Apologies for taking 10 more minutes of your time than promised. And see you next time. Do leave us a quick response before you go. Thank you. <laughs>